Hello, and thank you for joining the American Academy of Pediatrics webinar, Disaster Management for the Pediatrician in the COVID-19 Response. My name is Joelle Simpson. I am a pediatric emergency medicine physician, and I currently work at Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C. Uh, I am the Medical Director for Emergency Preparedness at Children's National, but I also serve as a member on the Executive Committee of the AAP Council on Disaster Preparedness and Recovery. I have no financial disclosures, and I do acknowledge that I have an interesting view of the COVID-19 response sitting here at Washington, D.C., but this presentation will hopefully apply to all pediatricians um, in the framework of disaster management, uh, which I've had some experience uh, with during this, ex during this response. Our talk today will talk about the impact of the, this pandemic on clinical care, uh, give some context to the disaster management framework as it applies to COVID-19. We will discuss crisis care management models, and very importantly, we will talk about physician wellness as we uh, continue to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19 started off as a public health emergency of international concern, uh, which is defined by the World Health Organization as an extraordinary event, which is determined to constitute a public health risk to other states through the international spread of disease and to potentially require a coordinated international response. As the virus progressed throughout the world, as you can see on this map, it became uh, very clear that it was now becoming a pandemic. So worldwide spread of a new disease, which has significant implications for us as pediatricians. On February 13th, when the president declared a national emergency, what that allowed was the secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to exercise authority to waive or modify requirements of Medicare, Medicaid, or the state children's health insurance programs, or the HIPAA, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, and privacy, the privacy rule in particular. As pediatricians, these programs often shape the way that we interact with our patients, so it's important to understand the framework we're now moving into as we respond to this pandemic and some of the requirements for these programs have changed and how that may be applied to your practice and your interaction with your patients. Let's take a step back into the disaster management framework and where our uh, situation with COVID-19 stands. So as someone that works in disaster management, we think about four phases in a disaster event. There's the preparedness phase, and typically an event may occur where we now have to respond as we do currently in COVID-19. There's recovery, and that's certainly an important phase um, in the aftermath of, of an event. And then there's mitigation. I'll point out on this slide that while mitigation is uh, in between recovery and preparedness, there are points at which we were um, aware of COVID-19 as a public health emergency, and we were already taking steps to mitigate its impact on our, on our patients and our population. And so mitigation can be seen so throughout the phases as well, but these four stages may be helpful to give you some context of how we respond um, in, a, in a disaster management framework. Since we're currently in the response phase, I wanna focus on that and talk about the stages of incident response. It's important that we recognize what the incident is and, and the declaration that this is a pandemic uh, sort of highlight, highlights that point. Then key after that is notification and activation of, of what uh, new status we're in, in terms of the nature of the event, mobilization of resources as needed, a restructuring of incident operations, which we've all, by the nature of this event, probably been forced to do for our practices, for our clinics, for our hospitals. And then at some point, we hope to get to a phase where we'd be able to demobilize and transition to recovery. And we have some countries that are currently able to be in this phase, and we're certainly important to learn from them as we you know, plan to, to reach that, that stage um, in our course. The structure of incident command is a common framework used across uh, typically response and planning agencies for disaster preparedness as a way to have similar language and similar roles uh, to better ease the response to um, a given event. Typically, an incident command is run by a commander who has the authority for conducting incident operations. I can give a 
example from my hospital where we have incident command as our, our executive uh, personnel who then delegate tasks to specific buckets of operations and roles and responsibilities um, that are pre-designated in our disaster response framework. And that may be someone who's in charge of operations for the hospital, someone in charge of planning, someone in charge of logistics, which is typically executing what the plans outlined. And then certainly it's important to have someone that is keeping track of the finances related to an event. Within that, uh, the idea of sort of, as, as we see with COVID-19, the importance of having someone who's in charge of communications, as well as liaison relationships are very key. Now, I know many pediatricians don't necessarily work in a hospital system, but we bring up this incident command structure as some framework that you might consider even for your office practice. Is there someone who has some uh, expertise or experience or willingness to do publicly facing communication from your office? Is there someone who seems to be comfortable or willing to take the lead on planning uh, or someone to take the lead on logistics. If you have the ability to, to delegate responsibilities to staff in such a framework, it often can help in streamlining the processes towards managing uh, disasters such as, uh, such as we're experiencing with COVID-19. Here are some practical steps to think about when you're preparing for a highly infectious disease such as the one we're facing. Universally, there's been communication uh, from the Centers for Disease Control about the importance of personal protective equipment and skills around appropriate donning and doffing of that. The, uh, that cannot be uh, understated enough that protecting our healthcare workers and our staff, um, it's extremely important to be mindful of um, the guidance around this that, that, is, that is issued by the Centers for Disease Control. Also, uh, being consistent with the screening algorithms for um, how to identify or potentially cohort patients that may have particular symptoms related to the infectious outbreak. And subsequent to that, figuring out ways, and sometimes they're creative ways, to isolate patients from each other so that uh, they are maybe mitigate, to mitigate the risk of um, exposure of patients who may not um, be screened for an infection. Uh, the principles of isolation have been very important, particularly for this outbreak. Understanding the principles of social distancing, particularly for patients that are in asymptomatic, um, to maintain a distance of at least six feet from other persons, as we've heard issued in the news, versus the implications of quarantine for patients that might have come from high-risk areas or have milder symptoms, um, or potentially screen based on the, the guidelines from the CDC uh, to be a potential COVID positive patient. Understanding those parameters are key um, and communicating those with the public and with your staff and having a method for communicating that is, um, is very helpful. Engaging state and local partners, and we'll talk more about this coming up, uh, can help to have a uniform response in your community for um, uh, in highly infectious disease. And then subsequent to that, thinking about how you manage your biohazardous waste um, and, and dispose of materials related to um, managing patients that may screen positive for an illness. M more so than ever, crisis communication has been a key topic around uh, COVID-19. Uh, communicating openly and honestly is most recommended. Um, as we are seen as pediatricians, as uh, conveyors of the appropriate public health messaging, correct public health messaging to inform our patients. Engaging the public as best you can, and, I, and recently there's been a lot of engagement with the media reaching out to medical professionals, for instance, to correct any messages that might be um, anxiety provoking or inaccurate in the public space, and providing timely and accurate information um, is helpful. Having a well-developed and a single overriding communications objective can often mitigate uh, in inaccuracies and, and surges of patients who are uh, concerned because of inaccurate information that was uh, put out to the public. A helpful resource in your community 
um, might be reaching out to their, your local uh, American Academy of Pediatrics chapter contact for disaster preparedness. There are, this is a resource of, pay, of providers that have uh, been stood up to represent disaster preparedness education um, and resources for local chapters um, and can be a point of contact you find on the AAP Children and Disasters website. The impact of this pandemic on clinical care is multi-pronged. One, we're been, we've been unfamiliar with this illness course. It is new, and so therefore there are new clinical algorithms that can be understandably very overwhelming, particularly as they evolve as we get more information about this illness. Having a plan to manage patient surge in combination with a deficit in the supply chain, such as uh, supplies for personal protective equipment and potentially medication, um, can be challenging. Having a plan for, for mitigating potential staffing shortages, and then also understanding the limitations around testing to have confirmed diagnosis of the disease can all uh, be complicating for managing clinical care. What's key and what we can have some, some uh, control over is, is helping with the public messaging, as stated before, and certainly managing the public alarm or often the worried well that may surge our offices. Marrying your messaging with the public health education that's being put out, as well as thinking outside of the box of creative ways to be open to new models of staffing and ideas for communicating with your families is, is important. From my experience here in Washington, D.C., we've thought about a few things that um, have been tried, certainly um, in the short amount of time. Uh, tried and true is difficult to state, but certainly some of the examples that have come up when I've surveyed some of our pediatricians in the community. First, and we've done this often when we've had the influenza pandemics or influenza epidemics, um, it's cohorting patients. Uh, being able to cohort well visits versus sick visits, either by time in the schedule, so having well visits potentially in the daytime, having sick visits coming in the afternoon can be helpful if, if it is possible. In large pediatric practices, there have been some that have offered that an entire office may serve as a sick site versus another office that would serve um, all of the well child care visits. Telemedicine has been a very helpful resource that uh, many hospital systems have uh, already started tapping into prior to the pandemic, um, and certainly uh, learning the other members of your disaster coalition or your network about how they've implemented telemedicine to bring it into your practice may be a resource that you can look for to, to have an alternate care practice model to serve your patients. There are some social distancing strategies that can be employed. So I've surveyed some pediatricians in our community who've now set up a system of patients that come by a, and stay in their car until they receive a text to come into the office so that they can maintain some social distancing uh, where either in their waiting room um, with limited space and so this is a means of which they've employed new rules to, to maintain social distancing. The other opportunity is uh, thinking about new staffing models. As you implement telemedicine, there may be a varied staffing models that you employ in order to serve your patients in this new framework. Pediatricians are the heart of the medical home in some ways with our families, um, and continuing to support and advocate for the medical home is important, but I understand that this crisis can put quite a burden on that role. Here are some thoughts I have about how you can support the medical home. Number one, it can't be overstated enough that reinforcing public health messaging to families is important. There's a lot of hospitals and health systems that now have, for instance, limitation on visitors. Um, so uh, if you're advising a family that needs uh, emergency care or clinical care in a hospital system, you may want to advise them about the limitations of, 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 of guardians or caretakers that are accompanying the patient um, and the importance of the public health messaging of limiting folks within the healthcare uh, or being exposed to the healthcare workforce to mitigate this pandemic. The other part is providing guidance on care of patients with complex needs um, who can be a vulnerable population um, in, in this response. Also important to provide feedback to public health and medical coalitions who might be guiding the public um, and hopefully with some pediatric insights and expertise. This can be seen in examples of 
providing input on the impact of canceled services on children, the closing of schools and playgrounds, and offering some suggested advice as pedi pediatricians about um, messages that can uh, support the medical home when these uh, social structures are no longer there for families. Also um, having input on public messaging um, that may be going out in your local media, that, that would be key. Leveraging technologies, and a perfect example is telemedicine, telemedicine to support the medical home is also key. Most importantly is recognizing that we are, as pediatricians, conveyors of, the, of parental trust. So what that means is the communications around this crisis, around uh, safe practice, social distancing, uh, public health messaging in general is often well received from numerous surveys from a pediatrician or from healthcare workers um, versus other entities. This survey highlights the, uh, the trust, parental trust across a number of agencies um, around providing information about children, about their own children to uh, particular entities. And hospitals, albeit also providers and physicians, um, and healthcare workers are at the top of the, pub of, public's, of the public's trust. Many of the resources I've talked about and the framework for which I've talked about disaster management can be found at the AAP Children and Disasters website. It can be found at www.aap.org disasters. And this may be a helpful resource to both connecting with your local chapter's AAP disaster contacts, as well as getting information sheets that have been um, uh, frameworks for doing office planning, uh, preparedness, communication to families, and many of the other items that I've discussed already in this presentation. An important role for us as pediatricians is also maintaining uh, some focus on personal preparedness. Having family preparedness plans, uh, which can be found in the resource that I just mentioned at the AAP website, um, recognizing the signs of compassion fatigue and how much we all are at the front of this of the workforce that's responding to the COVID-19 crisis but uh, being able to, to uh, work within our systems and our communities um, to support each other through it is important. Um, having plans for dependent care planning and then taking care of personal wellness. Um, I more than other, uh, I more than ever now realize that this is a marathon, not a sprint through this pandemic. And so very important to recognize that sleep, diet, hydration, movement, exercise, mental health, well-being, and maintaining healthy routines, uh, the, basically the, princess, the principle of uh, practice what we preach for our patients also applies to us. There are new challenges that come about with the recommendations to increase teleworking and working with our own children and families at home. Um, and soon to come are recommendations um, about how we might be able to uh, work within our systems and work with each other to, to better uh, support teleworking at home with families and the distractions that that might pose. This last page is a page for information and resources that are up to date, particularly around COVID-19. There are many people working to generate evidence as time goes on and as we have more cases to inform our clinical practice guidelines, our treatment protocols, our guidelines for quarantine and so forth. And so this is a helpful resource. The American Academy of Pediatrics has certainly been um, updating their website and there have been longstanding resource kits such as the Pediatric Preparedness Resource Kit that may be helpful uh, for you and your practice um, or even to understand the system within which you work uh, that uh, in order to respond to this uh, pandemic. Thank you again for taking the time to view this important webinar. If you have any questions regarding coronavirus disease 2019, please email covid-19 at aap.org.